That is the best song that we do that I didn't think was going to work out. Great job, worship team. How you guys doing? Venue Church. I am uh, Pastor Corey. This is Pastor Aaron. We'd love to meet you after if you're new to church. Uh, there's pizza with pastors actually coming up at some point on the calendar. So uh, scan the QR code. It's all in there. We would love to meet you and give you your next steps for Venue Church. So um, I feel like we should have explained why Layden is on a stool this morning. Um, Layden is under church discipline. But like not bad enough to keep him off stage entirely, apparently. <laughs> so he did something, but not something real bad. And so we put him on a stool back there. Um, actually, he's recovering from... Um, uh, knee surgery. So I was gonna, I'm like, should we explain him? Cause he's always j- jumping around. So, so I thought, I thought, what if we like put like a sign around his neck that says crippled man. And then at some time during the service, I could be like, rise and walk. And then uh, either he would, or he would fall to the ground. And, uh, and that, that's a bit of a service killer. So we decided against it. Um, I think a lot of teams, um, uh, often, You always hear me thank the kids team. There is one team today that uh, serves to put church on for the city, for you to come here. And it is the parking lot team. And I am so proud of you guys. I don't know, like, we're going to lose 30% of them today. And you will see them in heaven. It'll be okay. But they are committed to loving and serving you. And so you need to thank them when they're out there. Uh, it's just so important to us. Um, all right. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm in a, a series about money called Money and Emotions. Um, money shouldn't be emotional. It's just a tool, but it builds things that are very emotional to us. And so just in um, how we're going to respond to this and, and how God wants to teach us this. Now, the whole premise of, of this series is I'm, I'm not teaching you like I'm teaching strangers. I'm teaching you like I teach my kids like my dad taught me about money because I don't want anything from you. I just want something for you. And as a brother or sister in Christ, it does, it works really well for me when you do well. And that's, if you grew up in a healthy home where everybody was taking everything all the time, you don't get it really. But in my home, I wanted my brother to do well. As much as I make fun of him, I want him to do well. Like if he does better than me, great. Like that's kind of the point. And so, um, so that's really the preface of where we're coming at. And um, today's sermon is called uh, holes in pockets. Talking about your budget. Everybody says they've got one. Uh, holes in pockets. Sean uh, is my accountability partner. He's a, a great budgeter. Um, but it's really the perfect timing here that um, a change in weather like this, if you're not financially in a place where God wants you to be, and God wants you to be in a good, solid financial place. Uh, if you're not there yet, um, it's kind of good motivation. Is like the heat bills, what are they going to be, you know? Um, Pastor Aaron and I made some decisions uh, about eight or nine years ago that put us in a place where we are now, where it's like the heat bills can do whatever they want. It's not going to affect us because we have a budget for that. So my car can blow up and it's not going to affect us because we have a budget for that. And so uh, that's really what we want uh, for you as well. Um, Also, small groups have started. We are starting Financial Freedom University with Dave Ramsey. So if you need to get your finances reset, but there's so many other groups. There's an alpha group, new to faith, coming back to faith. Scan the QR code, join a small group right now. Um, but that, um, like the whole financial reset, that Dave Ramsey uh, small group is the best thing that we can offer you. And it's what Pastor Aaron and I went through maybe eight or, eight or nine years ago. So, um, Now, here's, I just, let me just start it like this. Everyone will be happy to advise you on your budget especially people who owe a lot of money because they like people like you because the story that they've told themselves about why they're not financially responsible is a story that you tell yourself and misery loves company. And so, um, but what they, what you don't want is, is everybody will advise you, but what you really need advice from, and we always say like, you're the average of your five closest friends. And so I would look at the five closest friends, how they budget and be like, Oh, okay. Um, But what you really don't want, that's harder to do, but once you do it, you'll realize the blessing is that you you want a friend um, who's like Chad on my team, who's great at budgeting, or Scott, or uh, or Sean, or uh, the Dowells, or I mean, like I could, the Morvillas, I could name like family after family who have really gotten a hold of this. Um, But it's also a little bit awkward too, because then when you buy something stupid, they're like, why did you buy that? 
You know, you can find anybody who's been like, that's a great idea. I should buy one of those too. I should buy four of those that you didn't know that you needed until you saw it. And so, um, anyways, um, Sean wouldn't tell you that. He would just think that. He would be like, why did you do that? And then he would overthink about how he was going to communicate that to you. And then sometime in the future, he would pray for you a lot. Um, but a guy like Chad's going to be like, that was dumb. I just don't, I don't see what you got out of that. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, I came up in industry, in the building industry. And so um, I'm an electrician by trade. It seemed like the dream was... Let's make as much money as we can, you know, burn your body out, make as much money as you can so that you can retire on a beach at the age of fill in the blank. So that to me was always a little bit problematic because I knew that most of them didn't have lives that were connected with God or really even connected with people, which is your purpose on this earth. But I always looked at that and I always thought to myself, so, so I'm on a beach at the age of 80 and that's all that I'm doing. Um, now don't get me wrong, Pastor Aaron and I love the beach, but just like, I want to retire at the age of 60 so that I can live the rest of my life on a beach. I'm like, I don't think that's going to make you happy because your purpose can't be found by yourself on a beach somewhere. So it's kind of problematic. And then the other side of that is I'm like, yeah, but you're supposed to do something with your days and not just like do nothing with all of your days, you know, like resting is for eventually working and serving in your purpose. And if connecting other people with God and people is your purpose, then work is really your purpose on this earth. And so I want to say like, yeah, but don't sacrifice your destiny because you just want to sit on the beach somewhere. Now, God gives his kids great things, but there's always a little bit of a problem in my mind. You know, um, if you've ever heard of studies for, I, I think the word is palliative care nurses. Am I right? Okay. Somebody nod. Doctors nod. Okay. I don't know. I even know what that means. Palliative care. Do they take care of pallets? Wooden pallets? That's what I think. Um, so in what they hear when somebody's on their deathbed and the last words that people hear, it's never about stuff. It's never about like, I wish I bought that car. I wish that I, I wish that I, it's always about a lack of connection with God and people that their stuff cost them. I worked so hard for all the stuff, but I didn't do the only thing that I care about now. So what I want to do is just fast forward to that time in your life. And I'm like, I don't want that to be you. I want you to pull the pain of that moment into this moment and be like, what actually matters with life and finance? What is it for? And what is the purpose of all of that? Sometimes people work very hard to get someplace they've never really thought about getting. And I'm like, I don't know that that's going to make you happy as being there on a beach by yourself. Like, congratulations. You're all by yourself on a beach. Like, So, um, now... You can't take anything with you into the next life. You can take anybody with you, though. On an eternal, connect them to Jesus, go to heaven, and see them forever. So if you think about that as an eternal goal, as an eternal treasure of somebody's eternity being changed forever... And then Jesus says, hey, all of this stuff down here, it's like you're just using it, but it's all going to wear out. And when you're gone, somebody else gets it. So all of this stuff is temporal. But Jesus says, you can actually use this to purchase this. Store not treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys everything and thieves break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven with the treasures from earth. He's like, use this to buy this. So that one day when you get to heaven, it will all make sense. And you'll actually be there with people that you're, rather than sacrifice, you know, you sacrifice a bit of your stuff to help somebody get to heaven and somebody get adopted. And so, um, and Jesus also says, um, also says, oh, if you seek first the kingdom of God, I'll take care of all this stuff too. Like that's your father in heaven, like all the stuff you're worried about, seek first the kingdom of God, I'll take care of all of this stuff. So, um. You can't take anything with you into the next life. You can't take anybody. Some of you are like, there's a few people I'd like to take into the afterlife right now. <laughs> take or send. That's a huge difference <laughs> there. I thought about that. Um, listen, today, uh, I don't want you to get focused on how much money uh, that you make. That's not what today is about. Not how much you make not how much income you have. Um, although I will, I will say this, and, and I'm just going to be as honest as I am with my own daughters. Work for a living. 
why should Pastor Aaron and I pay taxes to feed you when you don't want to feed yourself? So I'm not talking about you being crippled and you can't do it, like Layden over here. I'm talking about you being lazy and not wanting to work and want somebody else to pay for your life. Um, can I say that Grandpa didn't get that? Uh, Grandpa didn't get that. He, he thought that if you paid for lazy people to eat when they shouldn't eat, when the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Grandpa thought that when, if, you, if society started paying for lazy people, that it would eventually break society. And Grandpa was right, because it's breaking society. This whole idea of like, well, I just, I can't even. And I would rather stay at home and earn money for doing nothing. That is called theft. Look, if God himself said like, if a man doesn't work, he just shouldn't eat. So like, let him go hungry. He'll figure it out. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about not helping the needy. But if we pay people to stay at home and do nothing, we can't help the needy people because we used all the money to help these people. Come on, hippies, go get a job. Come on, every taxpayer out there be like, come on, hippies. Seriously, now. Okay. <laughs> There's more that I want to say about that. Okay. Um, don't focus on how much money you make today. Now, uh, God cannot bless holy pockets. He can't do it. You're like, what do you mean he can't? He can do anything. He won't do it. He won't do it. And I want to talk about this just for a minute. God cannot bless holy with an E pockets. Because that would make him unjust. Have you ever thought about this? It's like, God, give me the body of somebody who's not on my current seafood diet. Meaning I see food and I eat it. This body is a product of that diet. I see food and I eat it. But God, I'm not happy with this body. Give me the body of somebody else who doesn't do that. I do exercise. I'm just saying like, some of y'all got one six pack. I got a few. And I'd be like, God, I want one six pack. And God will be like, no. God cannot bless the holy pockets. You're asking him to do something that would make him unjust. I would be asking him to give me the harvest from somebody else's sowing. I won't do that for my own kids. I won't do that. It would make me unjust. It would set them up for failure in the future rather than teaching them the lessons of like, don't bail them out all the time. See, we don't have business brains anymore because we got bailouts. But back in the day, you just lost all your stuff. And so, all right. Um, don't pray. This is what we do. Some of our prayer lives are like this and I want you to change it. You're asking God for, to do something that only you can do. Does that make sense? God will do what only he does if you do what only you can do. Because miracles and the heaven's provision, heaven's currency is faith. It's not your need. And God's like, look, faith is you doing what little you can do so that I can do what great thing I can do. But if, if I do it and you won't sow any seed, then I'm actually enabling you and I'm a bad father. And God is not a bad father. So let's, let's, as we're talking about budgeting here, like that's what little we can do. And we're, we'll talk about that. My, my parents were uh, like Old Testament parents. And I wish that there was more Old Testament parents out there, which means that they just use their brains occasionally and all the time. Oh, you think it's funny? Cause and effect, everybody. Like, hey, let's actually look at the fruit on the tree and see if that made any sense. Now, my mom one time, um, I came home from school and um, I had an injury. I had sprained my thumb. And uh, when boys get injury, it's exciting. And uh, my brother was all worked up about this. And he's like, oh, this is awesome. And because uh, chicks dig scars. And um, if you don't have boys, you don't get that. Like, I don't have that in my family because my girls are not trying to destroy their bodies constantly. Um, but as a boy, it was exciting. And, uh, but I'm like, my brother comes home and he's all worked up about this. He's like, you got to tell mom. You got to tell mom. I'm like, I don't want to tell mom because I didn't want to tell mom how I got, how I sprained my thumb. And I tried to sprain my thumb, but uh, back in the... Do you guys know what a, de a dead leg is? Are you old enough to know what a dead leg is? So a dead leg is when somebody punches you right there. And I grew up, and that was normal for boys to be, like, trying to dead leg each other. Come on, somebody's, like... Everything's a little bubble wrap now, but this was, like, the life I grew up in. And so, so I was in the corner of a classroom trying to dead leg a, a farm kid who was bigger than I was. So I felt like that was a fair fight. And I was trying to dead leg him, and he was trying to dead leg me... And I punched his leg, and I, my, my hand glanced off his leg, 
And, um, but my thumb was sticking out and I hit a wall with my thumb and that's how I sprained my thumb. And that's why I didn't want to tell my mom that like I sprained my thumb punch, trying to punch a kid in the leg who was bigger than me. And also I'm like, I learned a lesson that day. Like if you want to punch somebody, put your dang thumb in, like watch a movie. Nobody punches with their thumb sticking out. It looks stupid. Come on, loosen up a little bit. I'm talking about money. It's going to start hurting a little more than this. So my mom was livid when she found out, not because I punched a kid. She was livid because my, uh, have you watched Nate Bargatze, the Christian comedian? He's like, my parents were Christians in the eighties and nineties. And that's when parents were the most Christian. And so my mom was the most Christian back then. And she was livid with me because I didn't ask her to pray for healing for my thumb. And the reason I didn't ask for healing for my thumb is because previously in my life, I had asked my dad to pray for me. And so often, uh, the prayer of faith will save the sick and call for the elders of the church. And so often I would be healed. But one time I asked dad to pray for me because I wasn't feeling good. I had a cold or something. And my dad says to me, hey, he says, weren't you the kid running around outside without a jacket yesterday? And I'm like, maybe. And he goes, I'm not praying for that kid. And that was a powerful day for me. You ever have those days when your brain just clicks and you're like, that's how the world works. I learned about God that day. I'm like, I'm not praying for stupid. Like, no. And I realized uh, that there is something about this that in our prayers for resources, we are actually asking God for something that not only... Like physically he could do it, but he won't because it would make him unjust. And God wants you to earn what little you can do. That's how what makes him a partner. Like you're in his family. He doesn't want to just like feed you ice cream forever. He wants you to stand up on your own feet, become a productive member of society so that he can trust you enough to pour all sorts of resources, not to you, but through you. Because your life is not about what you get. It's about what you give. Um. There's one of two things today. Um, some of you don't have a budget yet, so I want you to start a budget this week. Um, and some of you, and all the budget nerds out there, like Renee, are like, oh, we're talking about budget. Oh, this is so amazing. I'm so excited. Um, what budget nerds do is they will tweak their budget. So they will go through their budget again and be like, you know what? We can pull 50 bucks out of this, put it over here, and we can shuffle things around because you do need to tweak your, your budget. Or Now, business budget, family budget, personal, whatever that looks like for you. I'm just going to challenge you there. Go through it again and, uh, and tweak your budget. Or here's what I want to say, though. Here's what I want to say. You ready? Or don't. I feel like this is from the Lord for somebody. Or don't and worry about it and fight about it and be unhappy about it. Like, or don't. Or take your jacket off and run around in the snow if that's what you want to do. But I'm not praying for that kid. Our prayer team a year from now, they're going to be like, Were you, I saw you in the budget message last year. And you're like, I just don't have any money. You're like, I could pray for you or I could help you start a budget. So let me help you start a budget. So, um, Now, nobody will say that they don't have a budget. Before Pastor Aaron and I had a budget, we would never have said that we don't have a budget. We said we had a budget, but what we meant was we generally don't spend more than we make, so it kind of works out. That's sort of what we meant. Now, now um, a budget, this is what a budget actually is, we found out, is actually listing all of your income from all of your sources, all of that comes in, and all of your outcome that you're currently spending. So you got to go through your credit cards and be like, I spent this at Costco, I spent this at Starbucks, I'm putting somebody's kids through college at Starbucks, you know. I am, and, and the dangerous thing about this is that when you write it down, if you're married, your spouse is going to be like, you spent what on what? Are you kidding me? $400 in hot dogs. <laughs> but they have one too. And that's one of the things that keeps you out of actually looking at it. Is that you actually look, write it down and then you track it on a, a, I use a good budget app on my phone. You need somebody to help you set that up, by the way. Um, so I use a good budget app on my phone that we actually track every dollar that we make every time that we're at a till, every time we pay anything, that's where we track that. So that's actually what a budget is. Now, Pastor Erin and I, before that, we were actually pretty good with money. Like, she came from a frugal home. I came from a pastor's home, which is, has to be frugal. Um, but 
we had, we came from frugal homes. Like, we're not fancy people. Um, she's a bit high maintenance sometimes. Um, she called me high maintenance one time, and I was livid. Then I'm like, do you mean like demanding? And she goes, yeah. I'm like, okay, but I, I, get, I get that up. Um, so we were good with money, but we weren't great with money. And good and great are 50 miles apart from each other. I mean, like it's so far apart that we can't even recognize uh, the way that we used to do that. Now, there's two main reasons why we didn't have a budget. The first one was this emotional spending. Now, we all have emotional spending. Emotional spending, you know it's emotional when you have a story about why you bought it. And I am so good at stories. I love telling stories. I'm like, Pastor Aaron, I need a Triumph Rocket 3 motorcycle. I need it for my health. I need it because I ride with some people like Caplet who need Jesus still. And I'm like, and if I don't have this, people might not go to heaven. And that's not what you want, is it? It wasn't quite like that. But it's this idea of like when I want something... Now, my emotional spends are all, always vehicles, right? So that's what I care about. I care about vehicles. And I could, we could drop a lot of money on a vehicle, right? So, um, so that's my emotional spend is that. Um, also, she's like, what about the Ducati that you still have in the garage too? And I'm like, I have promised that I will sell that in the spring when it's a better time of year to sell it. <laughs> Unless the Lord doesn't want me to and speaks to a member of the congregation <laughs> who wants to be a friend. So if, if God says anything to you about that, let me know. Let her know. And then let me know about that. But I have promised I will sell them. All bought in a budget, by the way. Now, Pastor Aaron, her emotional spins are different. Uh, her emotional spins are vegetables. So, which is sad, you know, I'm like, I'm just so sad in my heart. Um, she had a friend once who had this sickness, um, that one time we were, we were camping with them and their trailer, you know, the, the holiday trailers, the fridges are always super small. And so I was going into town. I'm like, does anybody need anything? Uh, and she goes, yeah, we're completely out of vegetables. We don't have any vegetables and town is like seven minutes away. So I, just as an exper experiment, I just opened the fridge door, which with the fridge door, when, once I unlatched it, the whole fridge door sprang open. There was 12 different kinds of vegetables in there. And I'm like, I don't think there's enough humans in the campsite to eat all these vegetables. But why are we, you know, like it's a need to replenish something that's not even gone yet. And we have already started with extra that is going to rot. You know, Well, because Pastor Aaron's emotional thing, like she grew up, she, she went to Christian camp one year and she comes back and her mom's moved out and moved into the city. Divorce. Her mom didn't start with a lot. Eventually provided very well for her daughter. But, I mean, it was like the fridge would be empty. And those sorts of things of like, our fridge is empty. Like, I must stock it with stuff that you can't eat until it goes. You know, like that sort of, it's an emotional thing, right? So, um, it's the second reason. The first is emotional spends. The second reason is that you don't have a budget is that you just don't have a budget. I feel like I just need to say that because that's why you don't have a budget is because you just don't have one. So you're on a seafood diet. You're on a sea stuff and buy it diet. It's shiny. I want that. It's in my budget. Um, you haven't written anything down. You don't have a good budget on your phone and you're not tracking it. And the third reason is there's, I said there was two, but I lied. The third reason is just hurtful. You're just lazy. We were just lazy. And the Bible says, lazy has a brother named Destroyer. And that's scary because you don't think that they're connected. But lazy invites, you can spend your whole life, you know, you can have six really good months. And in one purchase, you just destroyed every, the wall that you just built around your house. You just destroyed all the things that God had been doing and you had been doing. And so laziness, and you're just a bit lazy. And so... Um, now, budgets are a lot harder now than they used to be. So, so some of you grew up in this world, and this is all that you know, is this world that you know. So you are constantly told you're not happy until you have this. But this is in front of you all the time. Now, back in the day, we didn't know that we didn't have cool stuff. We didn't even know what cool stuff was. Because if your friend didn't have one, you didn't know that it existed. And you're like, how old are you? I'm old. 
You saw it in a newspaper. Maybe. But you couldn't read. No, I'm just kidding. You saw advertisements in newspapers or on TV, but the reception was so bad you couldn't see what they were selling. But now everybody's got something and all of your Instagram friends are showing off what they bought and you're like, you don't know you need it until you see it and then you think that you need it. So it's a lot harder now. The other thing that makes it harder is called tap to pay. Why would they make it fun? I love like, get my credit card out, boom, yeah, what up? You know what we used to have to do? Carry dollar bills around with us and go, ow, ow, ow. Ow, 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 ow. You know what? I don't even need that thing. It doesn't hurt to tap. If you can synthesize that pain by every time you're at the till, like what we do, we open up our food budget app. I'm at Tim Hortons. I open up the good budget app, $2.70. I'm at Starbucks, $27. Every time I put it in there, it hurts me. And the line starts going down like, oh, that's your kid's future. You know, like, I'm going to drink coffee today. The heck with my kids. Um, <laughs> also, back in the day, you couldn't buy stuff with other people's money. We thought it was stealing. And so when you, you just didn't have stuff. So you couldn't fake success. You couldn't be like, look at me. I'm driving this. I'm like, some people are working jobs at minimum wage. And they're buying vehicles that I wouldn't even buy right now. And I could probably afford to. And I'm just like, why do we do that? Because we want to like look successful to other people. We care more about what other people think than our own futures and what God wants to do. So now ignoring a leaky budget is like stabbing yourself but not looking at it because it's scary. <laughs> like, I really need this. <gasps> and then you're like, oh, don't look. <laughs> I don't want to look at it. We'll just, like, we'll just put it on a credit card, <laughs> you know. Or they were like, dude, you know, then your friend is like, dude, just buy a, buy a thick sweater. Do you guys like this sweater? It's a scotch and soda sweater I got at Winners for like 30 bucks, which is a lot for a sweater for me, but it's scotch and soda. So it's pretty good. And just because I told you that, some of you want it now. Until I told you where it was, you didn't really think about it, did you? Right. Putting on a thicker sweater that you couldn't afford either. It's not going to stop the bleeding. That's already happening. So you got to take a look at it. Sooner or later, you just got to tear the band-aid off and take a look. Um, now, the only scripture that I'm preaching, I hope you actually do today. <laughs> I, re I recently was criticized by a teenager. Well, Pastor Aaron and I, remember we did that kind of team teach about parenting? Yeah. Ironically. <laughs> and a teenager is like, there wasn't enough scripture in that sermon. And I'm like, if my teenager ever said that, I would apply the scripture to them immediately <laughs> from the sermon about parenting and discipline. But here's the thing that I want to say. Don't get hung up on how much it is. Reading a hundred things in the Bible doesn't help if you do zero. In fact, the word of God says, uh, hearing and not doing is like seeing your face in a mirror, then immediately walking away thinking that you're in better shape than you just saw yourself in. So it's the doing of it that actually gets you in shape and gives you the clear vision of like, let's deal with reality. We can actually do this, right? And so having said that, Jesus says, and this is the, the most interesting passage about this that I could find. He goes, is there anybody here? He's talking to a, a crowd of Israelites who planning to build a new house doesn't first sit down and figure out the cost so you'll know if you can complete it. He's like, does anybody do this? Here's what I would say. If nobody did that, he probably wouldn't have to say that. You don't have to teach kids what they're already doing, right? So he's like, nobody here would do that, would they? He says, if you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you know, you're going to be like, you're going to have a great view of the stars and freeze to death in Canada, you know? This is what he's saying. Like, you're going to look pretty foolish. Watch what he's saying. This is hilarious to me. Everyone passing by <laughs> will poke fun at you, saying he started something he couldn't finish. So his, his tack is very interesting here because this is in a day, there was no bankruptcy then. If you ran out of stuff and owed somebody money, you had to sell somebody. The only social programs were in church. And if you didn't go to one of those, you know what I'm saying? Like you had to sell one of your kids off. And some of you were like, that would be great this week, actually. <laughs> 
or yourself or your spouse. Like this is literally, you know, the widow in the Bible runs out of money and the creditors are coming to take her kids. He's talking to a crowd like this. You're like, you're like, well, if I was motivated like that, I would surely sit down. And, and Jesus is like, no, you wouldn't. Watch what his tact is. His tact is, watch this, right? This is his motivation. He's like, <laughs> selling your kids into slavery doesn't seem to motivate you. This is his motivation. You don't want people to think you're an idiot, do you? You don't want people to make fun of you for being a knucklehead, do you? You don't want people to think you're stupid, do you? Use whatever motivation you have to. Jesus just did. He's just like, Jesse, you don't want people to think you're an idiot, do you? He could be like, Jesse, do this because it's right. Do this because it will set up your future. Do this because of all of these great biblical reasons. But what he says to Jesse, because he knows Jesse, it's like, you don't want people to think you're an idiot. Because you care too much about what other people think, and you care what you think about you way too much. He's like, use the motivation. Now, I'm just going to talk about our story uh, just for a couple of minutes here when I, as I, I kind of go through our budget just a little bit. In, is that uh, I came from the trades world, the building world. Um, I'm an electrician, and I, I was making decent money at the time. Um, <clears throat> earlier than that, Pastor Aaron was working with um, uh, for Canada Post. Um, and when we took my dad's church over, however many years ago that was, we took it over two years, then we came here. But in coming here, uh, I gave up $30-some thousand dollars a year in, 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 and went to one income, like 30000 some dollars a year, and went to pastor money to come here to do this on one income. So... Again, I'm telling you, it's not what your income is. It's what your outcome is. And so when you think about it like that, uh, we had to pay $100,000 more for a house here. Now, I want to tell you this, Pastor. It's like, don't tell people because they'll think we're bragging. I'm like, no, I'm going to talk like we're family because God, we're not God's favorites. We just gave him something to work with. He wants to do the same thing for you. So, like, why would I not? So we paid our house off last year. And so that's a great story to have. With that, because it's God's faithfulness. And look, all credit goes to God, but we still had to do the budget. We still had to plug the leaky holes to give him something to bless. So he's not enabling uh, poor money expenditure. So, um, and God doesn't like us more than he likes you. So I'm going to go through a couple of these. I just want to give you hope because it's scary to look at the wound, but also with the wound, there's something incredible there that you don't know is there until you actually write it down or look at it. So one line item of our, can I just be like super honest for six, a family of six back then. So our kids are bigger now and eat a little bit more. And you know, our costs have actually probably risen, but our amount of expenditure when we finally tweaked our budget. So, so what we started spending on, I, we call it incidentals, toilet paper, haircuts, shampoo, food, uh, decorating, snow shovels, Christmas gifts, um, birthday gifts, kind of like the broader picture. We started with a budget there that we thought would work for us at, of what we were spending at, at um, between sixteen and $1,700 a month for a family of six, which if you would look at that in most people's lives, you would be like, oh, that's not very high. Okay. We, since we came here and tweaked that budget down, we came here, we spend $975 a month for six people now. And that has not gone up, including all the COVID food inflations. And the cost of food has gone up. Our budget has not gone up with that. We eat better now than we did before. And we freed up six or $700 in our monthly budget. So like eight grand a year, what would you do with it? But you don't know it's there because you're afraid to look at the bleeding. But we didn't know it was there until we looked at it. And then you got to tweak it and be like, you know what? We don't actually don't need that here. Actually, we don't need that here. Actually, we don't need that here. Actually, and you know what? We enjoy what we eat now better than we did before. We don't pass it unless the fridge run out if we need to. There's like 10 grocery stores in town. God will take care of us. That's what we have grocery budgets for. But there's this idea of like we actually like what we buy now more than we did before because discipline has to do with it. When you prepare ahead for vacation, you enjoy vacation more because you're prepared ahead for it and you don't feel guilty because you can't afford it. Or you're just randomly going out and spoiling yourself when this other thing, like the discipline makes the food taste better. If you help make it, it tastes better. So come on up, worship team. 
But you got to actually sit down and write it down. Now, you need a couple in the church to help you actually go through it. It's a little embarrassing, but like we've all done it. Or, or don't and continue with your unhappy life. Um, listen, God wants to take care of you. Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? God wants to do something. He's trying to find a way to bless you. Now, um, this is a zero-based budget app, which means at the end of every month, if the number is zero, it's okay because it was in the budget for these purposes. Um, and so um, we, we tweak it often sometimes. Sometimes, you know, gas, we're driving a little bit more, so we'll pull a little out of living to go over there or schooling needs a little bit or, you know, you got to kind of shift stuff a little bit there. But the, the, the overall picture uh, is zero at the end of the day, and that's okay because that's what it's there for. Now, the first line item of our budget, I'm going to be talking about generosity in this series because um, it's so important, um, is we give t- a tenth before we pay taxes on it because I don't think the government is going to give to God and I don't think the government is feeding the poor like they say that they are. Um, but I want to... Dave Ramsey gives it before taxes. We do it as a family. I teach my daughters, give 10% on the biggest number. Give 10% off of that. And that actually, that investment, that 10%, God says, I'll actually take care of all the rest and make it more than it was before. And I'll do all of these other things in your life too. And God has never broken a promise. So if you want that promise, then you got to sow the seed. But stop praying for the blessing on somebody else's life when you won't sow the seed. So God will give you your own harvest in that sense. And so that's what we do. Um, And then it helps us with taxes a little bit. Taxes pay for sunshine and stuff too, guys. I hate paying taxes. Okay. Um, And then in no particular order, is this going to help you guys? We have like loan payments. Now we slammed our house off, so, but we don't have any loan payments anymore. So now that whole thing is a retirement thing. So that for us is great there, but you have loan payments, you have a retirement, you have your car upkeep, um, so that when your car breaks down, you have a bunch of money sitting in there. After a while, you like stores up money. And so like if something breaks down, you know, Arwen's got to, she had to do her transmission and she had money sitting in a budget and a friend called Eric Shute who did it for her. I'm like, you make sure you take care of him because that guy's gold. He'll fix anybody's car for free. <laughs> Listen, I still do my own oil changes and I can afford not to. You know why? Because I hate paying taxes. And every dollar I save, I save the tax on it. It's like earning another dollar with tax on top of it. I can make $100 cash in an hour changing oil in cars. And I'm too cheap for my... I don't want my daughters having to pay for it either. And I can do that. So I'm still too cheap to pay for an oil change. Now, I could do it and maybe next year I will. But right now, I'm making 100 bucks cash an hour. I like it. I like the money. I'm like Scrooge McDuck, man. I get all the dollar bills and I just roll around. Okay, I just made that up. That's gross. Um, schooling insurance. Can I talk about insurance? Shop it around. Every company out there is like, why aren't you loyal to us? I'm like, I am not loyal to you at all. I don't care about you at all. I care about family money. I care about my family. I'm not responsible to put your kids through college, not Yale anyways. Shop insurance around. We got $1,600 off of our house insurance a year. And then we gave it to another insurance company. And I love these guys. I don't know how they just like, Hey, we're going to charge you the maximum rate every year. And it's just going to keep climbing. God bless the insurance companies. Okay, shop it around. Why are you loyal to something that's like, it's a business. Shop it around. Get the best service. Get the best price. Entertainment budget. This is good to do. Coffee, Starbucks, eating out, gasoline, utilities. I'm going to have to steal something from somewhere to get it into utilities. And here's what I want to say to a clothing budget. This is important. Because of the clothing budget, it's like not a lot, but it's my fun money. And if you have anybody in your life, you know, in your family, in the budget, you're married to an Enneagram 7, listen, they're going to do something stupid with money. Create a category for them where it's okay. It doesn't have to be a lot. If you don't have any money, give yourself $30 to buy something real dumb. You want to buy gummy bears? Go buy gummy bears. Just don't do it while you're fasting. I'm like, you need to have a little freedom to be like, buy tacos if that's what you wanted to buy. No judgment, Eric. Just buy your tacos. Eat your dang tacos, and it's totally fine. Um, Vacation. 
Now, here's our thinking about vacation. And we vacation really well now, but we also budget for it. So we're not feeling guilty about it. Like, oh, pastor goes on vacation. I'm like, if we don't, like, we go crazy, and then the church dies, and we don't want to do that. But also, we pay for that, right? So, so, but Pastor Aaron and I, this is our thinking about vacation. You could go on a five-star vacation. I hear of people spending amounts of money on a vacation that are shocking to me. I'm like, I can do two four-star vacations on a five-star vacation budget, and I can do two of them, and that's eight stars, suckas. Woo! So that's just how we think about it. Now, every item that we ever buy, we open our phone at the till, and we make everybody wait for us, and we just go, dun, 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 pain, line goes down, and we know exactly where we're at, and we actually enjoy what we have. Let me end the sermon by this saying, God has a, a, look, he's a good father that is prepared for you. He has a window full, full of blessings, a heaven full of blessings with a window facing down, and there's two latches on it called budget and generosity. They're on your side. They're not on his side. He won't unlatch it for you. As we sing the next song, it will unleash heaven's power and anointing on your life. And all of a sudden money starts growing and it doesn't even make any sense and it doesn't even physically add up the way that it ought to. But God starts taking care of you and starts like taking care of every aspect of your life. And it's magical. Like it's absolutely magic what God does. I was thinking about David and Goliath. You know what killed Goliath? A sling and a stone that David already knew how to use. He knew how to use it. He just never used it on a giant before. You might be facing a financial giant, a sling and a stone. Budget, generosity.